uh, Diane made uh, a great one. I don't know if everyone heard. So Diane, if uh, you wouldn't mind sharing that again. Thank you. So um, there are two pediatric dentists who are a brother and sister team who are opening up a practice in Cumberland, Maryland. And they are slated to start sometime in October awaiting their credentialing. So we're very happy to have a close referral for the densest uh, part of, of the town where people can really have quite easy access to. So it's a walking distance practice to many, which will be great. So just wanted to spread the news. Thank you. That is fantastic news. Thank you for sharing. Um, does anyone else have any good news they'd like to share or any, anything? We don't take bad news. Okay, if not, um, let's get started with our agenda items. The first thing I hope um, everyone has received the most updated version of um, the report. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me first um, state that Dean Reynolds won't with won't be with us today. He has a university obligation, and I see Delegate Bagnell on the call. Is and hello. And any um, thing you'd like to say before we get started? I just wanted to say thank you again. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to jump off today. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Rory, um, from my um, my chief of staff, is here on the call as well. So, um, and and thank you all for for your hard and continued work. Great, thank you for uh, bringing him on the call. So, um, everyone received the um, updated version. Yes, anyone that has not. Great, um, and I hope you've had some time to review. There have been some additions uh, to the narrative and uh, we'd like to go over those before we start with our subgroups. And if anyone has any questions about recommendations from the last three subgroups, this would be the time that um, we make uh, have those comments. So in the intro introduction, there was, um, there's been language added from MDH, which you will see. So does anyone have any questions or comments about what has been included in the introduction? And if I could just interject, um, we talked about this a little bit at the last meeting that there will be um, a review from MDH after this, after you all vote on the report. And so there's a reference here to um, written comments from MDH. Those aren't reflected here now. This is initial feedback on background information on Medicaid, but we're expecting some follow-up, um, just written comments in response. And that's why you, there's a blank appendix at the end. So just clarifying what this is versus what is going to be coming later. Lindsay, is there any way we can increase the size of the document? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Oops, that's, is that okay? Is that, is that better? better? Okay, great. Thank you. So um, also just to clarify what you're seeing. Um, so the document that I have open in front of me is the one that would have been sent around noon today. Um, that's titled, that um, my title is blocked by my, um, my Zoom screen, but it's the update from today with track changes. So the most recent changes are both in track changes and they're highlighted yellow here. Those are the update, the highlighted yellow is updates from this morning. All the other track changes were sent in the prior draft version that Tyler circulated um, last Thursday, I think. Okay, thank you for that clarification. So no one has any comments about the introduction? The introduction. Oh. Yes, Mary. You're My mute. comment was the background. Are we just sticking with the introduction up top? I'm sorry. Or yeah, we're going to move to the background. Okay, that's that's great. First, thank you very much for for these additions. Um, I just have a comment, um, and the page numbers too. Thank you. On page three, mm -hmm. um, when you're talking 
one, two, three. One, two, three, four. Fifth paragraph down, down one more. Lindsay, I, when you're talking about the new adult dental benefit, um, thank you for including the services. Uh, if you could add periodontal service to that as well, that that is part of the coverage. So it's no like doubt. That? Right here. That's that's great. Just as yeah. long as it's terrific. Thank you. Thank you for um, pointing that out, Mayor, um, because that is a significant benefit. Um, OK, any other comments regarding the background? Can we scroll down some, please? Mayor, is your hand still up? I can't hear you. I said I apologize. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> Certainly. Okay, if um, we can scroll. All right, the next section was the practitioners. Um, the major changes here, oh, you'll see I, I did some line spacing changes. Those are the bars on the side. Um, but the changes here came in. Um, Let's see, we had a line about the dental assistants. And then um, there was a request last week to clarify the regulations that are forthcoming from the board. And I just wanna clarify uh, that these texts, the text in blue is from the conversation in the meeting uh, with everyone last week. We the, the highlighted yellow portions for what we talked about when we got feedback from uh, working with MDH. Uh, the blue is just from last week or two weeks ago discussion. Dr. Verma. Thank you. Um, just for clarity, the board is currently working on the EFTA regulations, um, but the way the legislation has come down, it is requiring a considerable rewrite to incorporate those. So um, just for clarity, um, those will not be in effect, even though the effective date of the legislation is October 1. Um, the EFTA regulations will not take effect until the secretary has um, reviewed and approved the, the regulations that the board will be sending down soon. So the way we have this right now is it's it says that the board of staff is in the process of drafting regulations and they are not likely to be effective until early 2023. Do you want to add some more specificity there as far as the process? Um, no, um, I think it's optimistic of us to think that it'll be early 2023, but um, we'll Would see. Would you rather just say until 2023? Um, yes, I think we could, we could take it take out early. I don't know because uh, the last regulations the board sent down took nearly 24 months to be approved. Um, so unfortunately, that's not in our hands um, and we have to be patient until those are, are signed off. So should we, did, are you comfortable with the 2023 being left there? Yes. Okay. Dr. Romain. So I, I was just going to say, is it wise to put pending the signature of the Secretary of Health? Like, so people understand the flow because 2023, it's unclear to me then where it's flowing. And that might be important information to the legislators that are reading this, but I would defer to Dr. Verma's opinion and knowledge on that, just as a suggestion. Um, I think the not likely to be effective until 2023 is accurate. Um, Um, and prior to or right after where it says until 2023, it should probably be um, included um, awaiting the signature of uh, awaiting approval from the Secretary of Health or some language to that effect. But the, the recommendations haven't been sent to the Secretary. No, they have not. Um, we are in the process of doing it. It is um, a complicated matter to ensure that we don't disenfranchise some of the assistance we already have in the process of making this, these new changes. Um, the legislation that has come through um, has some portions in it that are difficult to manage with the current system that we currently have in place. So we are working on doing, on trying to find a way to, to make the least number of people uncomfortable in order to get these new regulations in place. 
Um, there, the board is planning to have um, a comment period as well um, once these regulations are ready so that interested parties can make some comments. So it's likely that it may take um, 30 to 60 days to have the board complete those before we can send them down. And then um, at that point, I can't say how long it would take for the secretary to review and approve them. So I've added, um, if everyone can see, I've tried to highlight it, pending public comment and approval from the Secretary of Health, just to give a little bit more clarity on what that process is going to entail to the lay reader. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. So we can move forward. Um, we've added a, a paragraph here on community health workers, just to give a little bit more um, background on um, like the current status of community health workers in Maryland, um, because that was a topic that was discussed last time as a, another option for um, dental access. And these are discussed in a couple of the recommendations later as well. Okay, no comments then. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, sort of scrolling. The, that bar is just to close that gap that you see there. Oops. Then um, the other major changes that we get into here are um, the discussion on dental therapists in other states. Um, we added a line based on the feedback from the ADA about active um, dental therapists practicing in other states. So um, they were able to confirm them in Minnesota, Maine, and tribal territories of Alaska and Oregon. Unfortunately, in tribal territories, we couldn't get specific numbers because a lot of times the state licensing boards aren't tracking those practitioners because they're, for all intents and purposes, not in the state, technically. <laughs> um, so uh, rather than having specifics or, or trying to put in specifics when we didn't have them, we just left out the specific number of practitioners. Um, and then further down, um, this information um, was suggested by Dean Reynolds, the, um, the CODA requirements for um, actual scope of practice for the dental therapists are listed here. Um, and then we've also got listed the schools in the United States that offer dental therapy programs right now. Um, a couple of them are accredited by CODA and the Minnesota schools apparently operate um, under approval from the, the dental board in Minnesota. And then the end of this discussion was um, that there would be no recommendation from the task force relating to dental therapists. Uh, Dr. Coleman? Um, I think, but if, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe we did make a recommendation that we were going to say that we did not think that dental therapists would have an effect in our state. If I remember correctly. We didn't decline to make a recommendation. Our recommendation was that dental therapists were not something that Maryland would be looking at at this time. So, um, Lindsay and Tyler did, um, I don't recall the specific recommendation, but do we have notes from the conversation that? Um, as I recall it, this actual, this language, the way it was written was what we had, had written in during the meeting last time. Um, Tyler can correct me if I'm wrong about that, but I think that I, I took it that the, the conclusion was to make no recommendation. Um, like one way or another, but obviously the group can discuss right now if that's not the direction you'd like to go. Is there any other language below this regarding this? No, I think this is the end of the dental therapist. The next page, yep, starts on the loan repayment program. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think this is a big sticking point. I think it was something we discussed quite a bit. And I think in the end it was that we weren't trying, I mean, that was the whole point of this task force was to 
comment on this and our comment was that we were not going to make that we were not recommending dental therapists in the state. Dr. Verma. Thank you. Um, I'd like to second that. I believe that that's my recollection of the discussion as well. Um, that we had declined, uh, that we had said that dental therapy was not something that we would be considering for Maryland at this time. Dr. Romain. I, I would third that. I agree with it. It is a semantic point, but it does read in a way that uh, seems to not be as clear as I recall the discussion being that we were not pursuing dental therapy at this time. Just as an incidental to three lines before that, where it talks about the use of community dental health coordinators and then in parentheses CHWs, I think that can be confusing. The ADA model is the community dental health coordinator, CDHC, but CHWs, community health workers, are what are currently recognized in, in Maryland under the COMAR regulations that you were discussing earlier. Just a point. Um, okay, sorry, these are sort of two different thing, but just to clarify the community health worker point, um, I was under the impression that the um, ADA model was to focus community health workers that already exist on coordinating access to dental care rather than um, like a separate category of um, practitioner, if you will, or a separate role. So I don't, it, are you saying that these folks couldn't be community health workers that are just more focused on dental care? No, I just, did, they are community health workers, right? Absolutely. Like I, I would advocate for present community health workers to have some degree of dental training in their curriculum that's already on the Maryland website. So I, I just didn't want to confuse people the way it's written. Um, so let me access to dental care. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Maybe if we write is CHWs clear again, or should we write community health workers? That's all. Oh, I that acronym is, is um, used for the acronym we're discussing. Okay. But maybe if we said these can be CHWs focused on facility access to dental care, does that help clarify that they could be CHWs but aren't necessarily? Sure, sure, sure. I'm okay. sorry, Dr. Carlson, would you? Um, that, that's okay. Okay. That's okay. I just wanted to say that I agree with Dr. Romain and Dr. Verma that um, I seem to remember that we did say that we did not want to recommend dental therapists at this time. And if that would that would be my personal opinion too, that we not recommend it at this time. Not that we just declined to recommend, but we are not recommending it at this time. Is that what? Okay. You remember, Diane, you're, you're nodding your head too. And Dr. Verma. Yeah. So after studying the use of mid-level providers to improve dental access, the task force does not recommend licensing dental therapists at this time. Does that sound mm -hmm. good to everybody? Okay. Well, I don't know about licensing. Um, does not recommend... Yeah, I, I don't know about that, that either. I just think it needs to say that we are not recommending dental therapists in Maryland at this, at this time. time. Uh, how about authorizing dental therapists to practice in Maryland? No, because we don't have dental therapists. No, um, it should say. What about recognizing? Recognizing dental yeah. therapists? I think it's just like Dr. Carlson said, does not recommend dental therapist in the state of Maryland at this time. Yes, let's let's be clear about that. Uh, yeah. Um, I guess my question is, how would there be dental therapists other than by licensing them? By, uh, you know, licensing is our method of authorizing somebody to practice. So, well, they I mean, would. It, it's a position that would have to be developed. A curriculum. We don't have that. So um, I think by using licensing, it assumes that we have them, that they exist, and you know we want them to start working. The position hasn't been developed in this state, so we don't recommend um, pursuing that type of position in the state. So I think it, it simply say does not recommend dental therapy, dental therapists to. Uh, in Maryland at this time, not to practice, but 
not at all. Right. That I agree. I, I think we should not leave any any ambiguity there. Uh, you know. I agree. What if we said the use of dental therapists in Maryland at this time? I guess that without having some sort of verb, it's like does not recommend dental therapists existing in Maryland. You know what I mean? It's it, you've got to have something as far as what are they doing? They're practicing. They're they're seeing patients. They're doing something, right? Of course, we don't train them and we don't have them. We don't, we don't, we don't. Right. But hypothetically, them. someone could move from Minnesota as a dental therapist. And in order to but, practice here, it would be that they would have to be licensed. They don't have to be. Nobody has to be educated in Maryland to practice here. Right. So. What, so it's not, excuse me. recognize it as a as a recognized profession in Maryland. Um, Dr. Verma is. Uh, suggest it does not recommend dental therapy as an option at this time. Okay. Dr. Coyman, are you comfortable with that? Um, does not recommend, I mean, Darable, dental therapists. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say dental therapists because we're talking about the, right. Uh, but um, I, and I was fine with the way you had it, the use of dental therapists. Also, I mean, because yeah, we're I using. Think that I think the use of dental. It does the not de use of dental use. therapists. Yep. I think that's the clearest thing to say. We don't recommend the use of dental therapists. Jonathan had also made a recommendation of using the words dental therapy model, um, and that may be an option to consider. Um, cause technically that's the model that they're recommending is to use dental therapy. I could say it does not recommend the use of dental therapists or the dental therapy model in Maryland at this time. Does right. that help clarify it? Yep. I think so. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have an opinion before we move on? Thank you for the clarification. Okay, we can move on. All right. Um, there was just a small correction here um, on the amount um, that um, applicants can receive under the loan assistance repayment program. So this is background information. And that appears one more time later on in the recommendation related to that. Um, let's see. We've moved on to the section from the pediatric subgroup. Um, there was a question from Dr. Coyman last time about um, where whether these reimbursement rates were for were under the dental fee schedule. So that's just a clarification that yes, the, those are the dental fee schedules from those states. Dr. Coyman. Yeah, sorry. Um, it, it was the dental fee schedule, but it was the um, the medical reimbursement that I was wondering about. And I actually, uh, I apologize. I have that information for you and I'm just looking for it really quickly. But it, it, was, it was what the medical reimbursement um, rate was, not the dental. Um, because that's but, the issue is in, hospi in hospitals, they're getting reimbursed for dental procedures under the medical insurance at a rate that's not the same as the dental fees as as for other medical procedures. So is this title incorrectly? Are these the Medicaid? Oh, this is Medicaid. So it, these are the dental rates, not the medical. These rates. are yeah. These are the dental rates and not what the medical rates are. Okay. Um, so just for clarification, how are, when you go to the OR, are you reimbursed with the medical rates or the dental rates? Well, the anesthesiologist would be billing medical rates. So I, I was talking with uh, the surgery center, the people that were on here at one of the calls um, mm -hmm. that we did early in the beginning. And they said Maryland pays medical in minute increments at $1.52 a minute. And in 
Pennsylvania, it's $122 a unit for a 15 minute unit. But it was those rates um, that, you know, I don't know if we can get what the medical reimbursement rates are for okay. dental procedures. This, was, this, this information was what those folks actually that came in to speak to the group, this is what they had circulated. So these were the rates that they pulled up, which is why I assumed that these were the rates that they were talking about comparing, because this is what they sent to us. Yeah, I mean, that's not what they sent to me. I mean, these are the okay. dental, I mean, so I think this is like the dental, like what Maryland Healthy Smiles pays if you're doing general anesthesia in a dental office. Um, but it's not what is paid in the hospitals. Okay. Well, we can certainly change this information. Um, I don't know, Dr. Dr. Hughes, do you have a way to get that information? I mean, I'm not trying to work backwards here, but I, I do think it's maybe important. I, I'm trying to understand what's the discrepancy we want, what we're trying to relate here. I, I think what I'm, what I think we're trying to show is, is that the reimbursement rates in the hospital setting for anesthesia providers is so low that that's why they're not, that's why access to care to go to the OR and do these children under general anesthesia, that's why pediatric dentists are being kind of like shut out of hospitals now because the reimbursement rate's so low these are just what maryland like like the dental coverage is for ga like if you're doing in-office ga but they're not what the medical reimbursement rates are for ga okay dr Dorn. thank you uh, just to clarify with dr coyman uh, the, I think the two representatives that came to see us were from surgical centers, not related directly to hospitals. So I don't know, you know, what, what was the reimbursement they get the same as if your office was able to provide the general anesthesia? See, I think they get reimbursed at a different rate. I think what they're saying was, a, what was it? I think it was said like $1.52 a minute they get. Okay, Nancy, can would you like to address this? Yeah, I was just going to say that we can look up some of those um, reimbursement rates and come back to the committee with that information, looking at some of the different rates for anesthesia in Maryland Medicaid. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, so we'll update that accordingly. Um, I don't think there were a whole lot more changes here. Um, this is some information on the current non-emergency transportation. Um, some background on this. That was one of the um, recommendations that was discussed last week. And so there was discussion about putting in some background information on what's currently available. Okay, we can scroll, please. <clears throat> so you'll see where things were. I think a lot of this was just um, updates that were made literally in the meeting last week while we were, you know, typing some wordsmithing. Oops. And this is where that um, the transportation reimbursement, um, that discussion then centered around uninsured families rather than the Medicaid because of the existing transportation options. Again, these most of the changes here were made while we were discussing everything last week. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you just back up? I'm sorry, I didn't put my hand up, but I just saw something there back where it said dental assistance and dental hygienists. You go back up, back up. You go up. Right there, right there. 64. 
60, is it six or four? It's four. I'm sorry, where are we? You're down a page? It's the uh, new uh, four. item four. Oh, yeah, right. so the it's six dental, is crossed out and it became new recommendation four. Well, it four. says dental assistance. I think that should be a, like. Oh, assistance. Yes, thank you. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so as we continue down, um, one of these changes um, that I mentioned before to the current rate for the loan repayment assistance program, assistance repayment program. Um, The next one I've got here in yellow was, um, if you recall, Last um, meeting, uh, we had discussed um, the idea of the grant or loan program and housing that within the Maryland Community Health Resource Commission. Um, Since that meeting, I heard from um, Robin Elliott, who works with the Dental Action Coalition, um, on some feedback on um, whether or not it made sense to house it with the commission. or whether or not there would be some other options. And so uh, a suggestion was made um, from the um, from Dr. Hughes that instead of um, housing it with the commission, that MDH should convene a stakeholder work group to study the establishment of a, a grant or loan program, and then um, would work with the Maryland Community Health Resources Commission the Office of Oral Health, um, and the, I'm sorry, the way this, this track changes is <laughs> working, it's not very very obvious what's happening here, but it, we, they would be working with the Community Health Resources Commission, the Office of Oral Health, and the Community Dental Clinics Grant Program, which is a, another grant program that's in MDH, but it's not currently funded. Um, and then as part of that work, the work group would then make a recommendation on an appropriate entity to manage a loan or grant program. Dr. Doran. I actually like this wording. I would just include uh, and promotion of such a program. So this this stakeholder work group comes up with suggestions how to get the word out to uh, recent grads. And we even met at the Chesapeake Dental Conference, Dr. Hughes and I, someone who'd been practicing for 10 years, still has great student loans, is in an underserved area, and didn't even know about the program. So Uh, I want to stress uh, promotion of of this good program. Thank you. I've just added and promotion of the program here. All right, continuing along, let's see. Um, This, the track changes here was just, um, I think a spacing and font change, if you recall, this language had shown up in bold um, last time, inadvertently, last time we met. So there weren't a lot of changes from last week in this section, or I I keep saying last week, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, last meeting. Okay, and then moving along to the Um, elderly subgroup section, there were a few places in here where um, Dr. Doreen um, provided some additional background information that we've included here. Um, We've got language on incurred medical expense and long-term care facilities. I'll just keep stro- scrolling in case anyone, anyone stops me. Um, and the background here on long-term care facilities um, was in relation to one of the recommendations on um, training programs for staff on providing oral care. So we've also added a footnote here with some links to um, training programs that Dr. Romain suggested um, that would be a potential model.
All right, so that's that's where we left off um, at the end of the elderly subgroups discussion. So that our next step would be moving on to the new the new parts of the report that we didn't discuss last time. So we're with the individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Is there any discussion of um, Lindsay, didn't you, did you say you had some comments from Christy? I do. Oops, I'm scrolling too fast. Sorry. So um, I did get some feedback from Christy Russell. Hers are all in relation to the recommendation portion of the discussion. So there's this short background. If anyone has any feedback there and then moving on to the recommendations. I do have a couple of comments from her. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to make it to this meeting, but she emailed me some feedback. So let's move on to those recommendations. All right, so the first two recommendations were um, pretty straightforward. Um, the third one is the first that I had feedback from Christy on, but I don't wanna so jump back. I, I have a question about number one. Um, would this be better placed on the um, MCO's website for their um, the practitioner profile? Does the board have a, a practitioner profile? Well, they have a searchable database. Dr. Coyman? Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, all of our dental offices have to be ADA friendly. I mean, we won't, you can't even get a permit without making sure they're ADA friendly. So, I mean, all of our offices have to be wheelchair accessible. Um, so, I'm not sure if it's redundant in recommending this. I'm gonna put it up to you guys to correct me if I'm wrong. Dr. Verma, is your hand still up? Yeah, so that was the same thing I was gonna say that everybody's required to be ADA compliant. So it would be, um, as Dr. Coleman said, a redundancy in order to have that because everybody's supposed to meet that uh, minimum requirement in order to get a use and occupancy permit for a dental practice. Um, so, um, Currently, this is not a searchable criteria um, for on the board's website. Um, that task typically will take a little bit longer. As you know, we had um, some issues with connectivity to MDH um, in December of last year. So we're still working on getting um, all of the connectivity back. Um, and that may take some additional time in order to do. So I don't know if this would necessarily be a useful function because everybody should be meeting this requirement. So does everyone agree that this is something we can remove? Any objection to that? So, so just to clarify, the wheelchair accessibility is, is one piece of this. Disability friendly is, is perhaps vague, but there's perhaps some other, if anyone from this subgroup is available that could comment on what might be entailed in disability friendly that might not be otherwise covered under the ADA. And then accepts Medicaid is the last sort of portion of this re recommendation. Just something for uh, the group's consideration. Uh, I'm not denying the rules about ADA compliance for getting a uh, dental practice established, but the subgroup reported, um, particularly um, Chrissy Russell um, and subcommittee did a um, sort of a small survey or like focus group and um, had respondents say that lack of wheelchair accessibility was a reason for them not visiting a dentist in um, the past year. So there might be a discrepancy with policy and practice that the subgroup had in mind if one of them wants to speak to that um, or if that's just something they wanna consider. Dr. Doring. I would say there's some practices that are more accessible uh, for those with disabilities. Uh, some older practices may be in office condos or homes, for example, that may have been grandfathered in. Others in office buildings may have narrow hallways mm -hmm. and doorways that don't permit. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Um, and absolutely in new construction and restrooms and, and things, those are all 
uh, must be complied with in new construction, but someone maybe with an older office may have uh, not comply. So I think it is valuable data. I don't know where it would be properly displayed. Um, I don't know if that's something that the state board wants to, to tackle, or maybe there's an association of dentists that provide care to this population that could put something together. Dr. Berman, do you have an opinion about that? Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm not certain whether that would be a place where people would come to necessarily look for that particular information. I, I find that people who are looking for that tend to go to the insurance portal or where they're looking for it in order to filter their providers by the search criteria they're seeking. Um, so um, I don't know if it's a useful um, addition or not. Um, I think I will defer to the committee's uh, recommendation. If that's something we need to undertake, then we'll certainly see what the pathway is for that. So currently, so I'd like to know, does anyone, has anyone accessed the um, Maryland Healthy Smiles website? Is this information something that's available there? That, that's what I was gonna say, Dr. Hughes. I mean, I think this makes sense to put it on the Maryland Healthy Smiles um, database. So we don't know if that's currently available there? I, I don't think wheelchair accessibility is on there, but it okay. seems like. Okay. I think we do have information on providers that are accepting patients for our adult dental pilot program, which would be a similar population. So you're saying the information is there? It's not quite the same information, but it, it's close. Mm. So what's lacking that needs to be added here? I mean, I don't know what they're intending by a disability friendly designation mm -hmm. per se, but we do have our adult dental pilot program is really targeting those 21 to 64 year olds that are on both Medicare and Medicaid, which do tend to be the disabled population. Mary, you have um, an additional comment? I'm just uh, 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 saying what Nancy's saying. We did an audit of the SkyGen directory when the pilot program came out. One of the recommendations was to add a question about that, which I believe SkyGen did add. So I'm reinforcing, but it's something that um, the language needs to be reviewed to address everything that is being addressed in number one. So we do want to keep um, wheelchair accessible. Yes. So we're not clear um, with disability Dr. friendly. Yes. Dr. Hughes, I'm looking at the Maryland Healthy Smiles website. It actually, if you go under the search criteria, mm -hmm. there is a tick, tick box that both says there, if you can check it, if you're looking for auspices that are accessible to people with disabilities. And there's also another checkbox to search for uh, special needs, providers that work with special needs. So those are both searchable items on the Maryland Healthy Provider uh, defined. So with that said, do we think that this is a recommendation that needs to stay? I'm thinking that it does not. If we don't have anything else additionally specific to that, if you go on the Maryland Healthy Smiles, you can locate a provider that has wheelchair accessibility and um, is open to seeing disabled patients. Am I, is that correct? Okay. So is the recommendation to remove this? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, thank you. So number two, encourage practitioners to provide information on dental procedures in plain language. So this is uh, regarding health education. Have we had any um, other recommendations about health ed education that would address this? Dr. Verma? 
So not specifically exactly. I'm just reading number three where it says require the board to create and distribute plain language information. That's typically not something that the board does um, as far as informed consent. Those are usually things, documents that are created that are available in general to providers or providers create them individually themselves. So that would need to be, um, the board would need to be removed from that recommendation. Okay. If I can interject briefly, this is one of the ones that Christy had feedback on, and she mm -hmm. said it may make sense for MDH to create the plain language resources in consultation with the board for wide distribution through Medicaid providers. The Maryland Developmental Disabilities Council previously worked with MDH to create plain language resources around COVID. That was her feedback on this one. So I think even in that recommendation, the board, that needs to be removed because that is not something they do. Um, uh, Dr. Dorn, you had, had your hand up first. So Yes, uh, I scratched out board too, and I put, sorry to say this, the Office of Oral Health maybe should take this on. So we can put MDH to be less specific. <laughs> and then they can assign it? Yes. But we certainly... Um, do create and uh, plain language information. So, so um, I'm looking at two though, two and three should be able to be incorporated somehow. So could we say require the creation and distribution that practitioners um, use? or something to that effect, because I don't think we need two separate ones. Any opinion? Um, information about dental procedures like that? So that's a separate act. Would, um, when you say where to locate providers who accepts Medicaid, that would be separate from uh, creating the plain language educational material. Because we do have resources now that um, show community clinics that accept Medicaid and what procedures uh, and, and the populations they serve. So, so what I'm basically trying to do is to incorporate two and three. Right. So if we said require MDH to create and distribute plain language information and resources on the importance of regular dental appointments and information about dental procedures, that can be, where that to can locate be used, utilized by practic all practitioners. Dr. Dorn? Yeah, I, I was going to say, and on number three, end after the first sentence, and then, and then put, a, a, well, let me read it, require the uh, MDH to create and distribute plain language information and resource on the importance of regular dental appointments and encourage practitioners to provide information about dental procedures in plain language. If you wanted to combine it that way. And then I think you're right, the Medicaid part needs to be separate. I'm going to itemize well, these, no, so it's a little bit. I don't, I don't think this is stated properly because the, we want the creation of um, health education that's in plain language and, the, and then encourage providers to use that information. Okay, that's fine. Okay, I'm trying to um, use bullet points to make it a little bit more clear, the distinction between these, if that makes So I lost an E, um, there it is. <laughs> Can you explain language educational materials? Educational materials instead of information resources. 
Yes, please. So we've got require MDH to create and distribute plain language educational materials on the importance of regular dental appointments. Um, now this doesn't lead in properly. Um, We'd need to add provide here. information on where to locate providers who accept Medicaid and provide information on procedures covered under Medicaid. And then it's and med requiring MDH to encourage dental providers to provide information about dental procedures in plain language. But I would still say that the Medicaid portion should be, should be a separate bullet. So if I do this, does that make it a little bit more clear? Those are three bullets under create and distribute. Um. I'm not sure that that is addressing the issue exactly. I'm not sure where B fits in with this. So B, we want- B we was want going to, in recommendation two. Right. right. So I think what I'm system. trying to say is we wanna create these materials that are accessible to providers. because they've been created. Now we want the providers to use them for their patients. We, we, you know, we've created the plain language materials. Yeah, I think if you scroll, yes. if you scroll down a little bit. Yeah, if it says encourage dental providers to use these materials and distribute these materials to their patients under B, would that fix your problem, your address your issue, Dr. Hughes? Yes. Yes. So MDH is creating and distributing plain language educational materials on the importance of regular dentist appointments, plain language information on dental procedures. Um, this doesn't follow, sorry. Providing information on where to locate providers who accept Medicaid. And then this is gonna be a D. And then we can just say A1 because there's, or A, because there is no, nothing after A1 and two. that make sense to everyone? Perhaps this is better for patients on where to locate providers, for patients on procedures covered under Medicaid. Um, so I'm, I'm still thinking that B and C should be the responsibility of the uh, insurance company. And that that doesn't necessarily relate to the, um, the type of educational materials that are required in office. But as I said before, we do provide a resource guide that indicates what um, community clinics do accept Medicaid and what procedures they um, do. I, I just don't, I'm, it, it's just not clear to, for me. Dr. Corman. Yeah, thanks Dr. Hughes. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I mean, that's, 
that information, I mean, I mean, if you go to the Maryland Healthy Smiles member portal, I mean, it gives you, you know, where providers are that they can search by zip code or whatever. I mean, so that's already there. And I, I'm just looking in the member handbook. I believe it does show what, um, I mean, it has everything in there about making, keeping dental appointments, when to visit the dentist, um, what the benefits are for children and REM. Um, and it talks about not covered services. I mean, so I do think that it's all there. And in, in, this is the member handbook that goes out to anybody that does. So, I mean, I don't know if you want me to upload this to you guys, if that helps, but um, I mean, all this information is already there. So our BNC perhaps not necessary, and it's just creating and distributing the educational materials and then encouraging dental providers to use them. I think that would get more to the point. I agree. Okay. Is everyone comfortable with that? Okay. So number four. Is there anyone from the subgroup that could address this? Is this um, uh, Dr. Berman? Yes. Yeah, thank you for the question. I'm, I would like some clarity as well because establishing a new licensure or a certification um, is a lengthy process um, and not something that's easy to do. It would require legislation um, and uh, considerable uh, regulations to promulgate. So I'd just like to be sure that we're um, thinking through how, who's licensing these people. And is it possible to use the child life specialist that already exists, Dr. Doring? Some of this is probably already in the education of the CDHCs that we already talked about. Dr. Romain maybe can comment on that. But certainly uh, preparing the parents and children for procedures, uh, support res resources, those would fall under the CDHC. And that's... Um, training that wouldn't require a licensure. Uh, that's some as a staff, a dental assistant hygienist could get that training or a social worker uh, to fill that. I agree, Dr. Doring. I was going to say the same thing. So is this um, a recommendation you feel comfortable deleting with a, uh, yes, Dr. Romain? I would say, yes, I feel comfortable deleting it. Um, the CDHC core competencies are advocating for community capacity building skills, effective oral and written communication skills, cultural competency, efficacy of confidentiality, knowledge of local resources and system navigation, care coordination, teaching skills to promote healthy behavior change, outreach, and public health and health literacy concepts. So I definitely agree it's covered under that model that was just a lot of effort was made uh, to um, make that a certification and also to develop guidelines for curriculums and get some of the eight or 10 programs that are up and running across the state going. So I think it would be best to slide this um, intention into community health workers. Thank you. So I'll delete this one. Yes. So um, number five is one that has been discussed. 
so we can delete that one because that's now frequently um, recommended. One of our frequently recommend frequent recommendations. So we don't need it here, I don't think. And you had um, comments from Christy for the six, seven, and eight? Yes, for okay. six, Christy wrote, um, yes, your recommendation makes sense to first study the number of dentists in Medicaid, including their region and accessibility. So rather than saying increase the number of dentists participating in Medicaid, this would be require Medicaid to study, conduct a study on increasing pro provider participation. And then Nathan. we could specifically say, including region and accessibility. Well, actually we have um, mappings that show where the Medicaid providers practice. So I don't know if an additional study would be required, but Nancy, you comment please. Yeah, I was going to add that we already have some of that data and mapping um, and in addition, it's data that we already already include in our annual oral health JCR um, that we're actually working on finalizing right now. Um, yeah, I think, I think maybe the idea more so than under is if the study is on increasing pr provider participation, it would be perhaps with a focus on region and accessibility if there's certain regions that are underserved. Yeah. And we do have that data by region. So I, I do you, would you all be uh, comfortable with deleting this? Because we, that um, information, that data is available. Yes. Do you so want to delete, delete the recommendation completely so that this, there's no study? Well, we have this, we have the data. I think that Christie's comment is not not so much having the data, so much having utilizing that data when analyzing issues with recruiting more participation or increasing participation levels. It's not, you know, uh, gathering the data was my understanding of her comment. Right, it'd be using that data to then figure out how to increase participation. And we do use that data to increase participation. We have currently some weekly meetings going on with Skygen specifically for our new adult expansion. And one of the constant talking points is how to recruit more providers for the program. And that's in, on top of um, the regular meetings that we've already been having, which frequently touch upon the same issue. So it's not like it's something that we're not trying to address. Dr. Klein. Just speaking from SkyGen also, I mean, this is a consistent thing that is being done at all times to expand the provider network, so. So we're comfortable with deleting six. And what was her comment regarding seven? Um, so seven, we had this discussion note on what the increase in annual Medicaid expenditure caps would look like, or how would that, how would that be? Um, and Christy wrote, higher Medicaid expenditure caps will allow more people to utilize the service without out-of-pocket costs, a barrier for many with dis disabilities who are on fixed or limited incomes. I defer to Sarah to help further explain this recommendation. So there are no caps. There will be no caps for the population. Yeah, the cap will go away on Jan January 1st when we expand the adult, the, when the adult dental pilot program is sunset and into the new adult expansion pro program. So we can delete this one as well. And the comment for number eight. So this is about increasing the number of mobile dental clinics. And um, so our discussion note was, you know, how would that happen? Um, Chris, you wrote, this is essential for anyone who lacks access to transportation, perhaps a partnership with LHD, Sarah may have more information on what this could look like. So the question is, how would these um, mobile units be funded? Right, like who, And where would they be housed? How is this expanding? Does anyone, Dr. Coleman? Um, I mean, I feel like there are a lot of these dental fans that um, come from different areas. Um, you know, we did put regulations on these mobile providers where they have to be tied to a brick and mortar office. 
um, a few years back. Um, but it's just a matter of, you know, I, I don't, I think there's enough private sort of mobile providers that, I mean, I, I mean, I guess you could, you know, uh, increase them, but I mean, I think there are out there. I just, I don't know that this is something that like, so, I mean, I understand it, but I just don't know how you entice people to like create more mobile units. So is there any, um, uh, let, is there any uh, information that uh, can tell how many mobile units there are in the state and where they are located? Is there any information like that available? Maybe that's something we could look at as, you know, what's current, you know, where are they? Where are they practicing? Um, something to that effect. Any thought about that, Dr. Dorn? At some long-term care facilities do have dental facilities within them. And then one of the things that I try to do when the dental students come back on rotation on externships is to show them how portable dentistry can be done in the patient's room uh, or beauty salon works really well because of sinks and countertops. Um, so not necessarily does it have to involve the expense of a van, uh, but somehow encouraging more practitioners to uh, offer services in long-term care facilities, I think would be important. Dr. Verma. So the board does collect information on where licensees practice. Um, however, that is still in the process of becoming a searchable database. Mm -hmm. um, it could certainly be included um, in that evaluation to determine um, whether they're a mobile practice or a brick and mortar practice. Okay. Um, so do we need more education for our providers about the use of um, mobile uh, dentistry? Is, would that be a recommendation? I'm not sure how we want to uh, word this. about mobile and portable dentistry. So is this recommendation focused on understanding the current landscape of mobile and portable providers, or is it on educating the public on how to access those providers, um, whether it's making it a searchable database with the board or some other source of information? I guess the question is, is it understanding the landscape, increasing that landscape, or educating the, pop the general population on the existence of that landscape, or all of the above? All of the above. <laughs> so are we first tasking the board with this? The board should... Um... Are we, Dr. Verma, is, are we tasking <laughs> the board with this? <laughs> I would um, perhaps consider um, encouraging um, licensees and, and providers to be educated in portable dentistry, as Dr. Doring had mentioned, because there are many methods that they could provide their time. Many um, licensees already volunteer time in different ways, and this would be another option for them to either volunteer time or, or educate themselves better on that. So perhaps it would be good to encourage licensees to be educated in portable dentistry and to uh, recommend that the board consider a refining feature on their searchable database to determine which providers are mobile. What about if it was at, at initial and renewal like of a license? Um, the practitioners shall, I, this might have to be reworded, but I'm just trying to get the thought out, shall provide information on whether they provide mobile or portable dental service services. The board should incorporate this information um, into a searchable feature on the website. 
Yeah, I think that would be good. That's something we could work towards as we're refining our database. Um, and then the last piece is educating the public on the existence of the provider, the providers. Well, the, both the, the providers and the public. So who's, who's tasked with educating providers about expanding the methods of providing service? Is that on the board as well? The board does not provide education of, of pretty much any type. Um, so that's not something the board would be able to do. Um, there are lots of people out there that provide continuing education in various methods. And I think it would be encouraging for our providers to seek that type of continuing education. So encourage <laughs> providers to seek, yeah. Dr. Dorn, are you muted? Thank you. Uh, you know, the Maryland State Dental Association could be a resource and and possibly putting on uh, another clinic course that covers this topic and, and other study clubs and organizations, and certainly our dental school as well. Um, so professional organizations should encourage members to become educated on um, I, I would say that continuing education providers should be, because not all of them are profes through professional organizations. They're at the dental school, they're through other um, educational routes. I think we could just leave it at, at or portable means and then, you know, um, that if there. folks are seeking it, then it will appear. Yeah. <laughs> Someone yeah. will provide I mean, it if, if the providers are seeking it. Yes. Dr. Romain. So I think this is a really good idea to quantify, you know, even the groups that do go into long-term care facilities already. I mean, I did some initial research into some of them, but it, it seems like something a lot of people don't know about. A lot of these groups use IME, incurred medical expense money, to have residents in long-term care facilities kind of purchase a um, dental benefit. So as we roll out the adult mm -hmm. dental Medicaid program, I think it's going to be important we know that we know who's going into the homes and who, who's doing these works. I think we'll be able to have a better coordinated effort. Great, thank you. So um, I just wanna keep the group mindful of the time. It is 5.15, we have completed one subgroup and we have two more to complete. So let's start with, um, next is Medicaid. Um, and this, this language at the top that was struck has actually just been inserted further up where the rest of that background information on Medicaid came in from MDH. So that was just moved. It's still in the report. Any discussion about that? Any concerns? So then we have the exhibits. Any con questions or concerns about those? Any questions about this narrative and barriers to care? Dr. Dorn. Sorry, I, I was looking at the table that uh, starts on the bottom of 23 and runs on the top of 24 page. Uh, I was just wondering, you look at the highest total of dentists participating in the um, Medicaid was in uh, 2019, and then we hit COVID, uh, and then we see a sort of a big drop there. And I'm wondering how big a COVID effect we had uh, that caused the drop. And I'd be interested in seeing data in 2021. I just say just a comment. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Yeah, we are working on that 2021 data right now. And from our preliminary estimates, we are seeing um, an increase in 2021 over 2020 about the number of dentists um, participating in that, even in that next table where some of it's the dental board's data. So more dentists both participating in the state as a whole, as well as more dentists participating in Medicaid and more dentists um, billing. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, going along uh, with what Dr. Doring said, I mean, could we at least may put, I mean, I'm not trying to be nitpicky, but could we just put an asterisk for that year and just write COVID so it just draws attention for 2020 that that was COVID? I don't know, Dr. Doring, if you think that means anything. I don't think anyone will ever forget the dates of COVID. <laughs> it's true. Okay, can we move on to the barriers to care? Any comments here about this narrative? So if not, let's move to the recommendations. So here again, we had um, a recommendation relating to the increase in the number of mobile providers. Um, given the discussion that we just had, maybe that should be removed. Is the group in favor of removing this first recommendation? Yes. Um, and just to clarify, not the whole first recommendation, just the, uh, the first bullet of the first recommendation. This increase in the number of mobile providers. There are two other pieces to this. They, these were all related to increasing access to providers in rural areas. So the other two bullets are the creating provider incentives and enhancing transportation benefits. And then we have also have a discussion note here about who should be tasked with each of these things. So I would go, I would ask Nancy a question. Do you think that the transportation benefits could be enhanced? I mean, I think we talked about this at the last meeting and that there was language added to the report as well about our non-emergency transportation benefit. So I think if we're in deleting recommendations that have already been discussed, maybe that last bullet point about enhancing the transportation benefit needs to be looked at. So let's talk about creating provider, <clears throat> excuse me, incentives. Was there a thought of um, Dr. Coyne? Yeah, I mean, I think the provider incentives we kind of listed out earlier in the discussion about different things that we could do as far as tuition reimbursement or low rate loans or things like grants. Um, so I don't know if it makes, I mean, if it's here just because reinforcing the other one, I mean, I don't know if we can refer it back these things to what have been said before, but um, I feel like they've been recommended. So are we comfortable with removing one in, in its entirety? So I don't hear any objections. So I think we will delete one. Okay, and I'm gonna delete the lead-in language there as well because that's the only recommendation there on um, rural areas. Okay. Uh, number two, I think we just had a, a discussion regarding this. Any comment? Dr. Corman, use your hand up. Thank you. Does anyone um, have any discussion? Do you feel like that we this has been discussed and already recommended? Okay, so I think we can delete number two. Number three, social media. Any discussion regarding this? Nancy. This is something we are working internal communications team about just seeing if we can get any social media posts. Um, I believe we've already had some, some conversations with MDAC about this as well. So this is something that is on specific, this is more specifically about the adult dental expansion, but this is something that we are considering and doing. So do you feel like it does not need to be a recommendation? 
I have a question. I'm sorry. I have a question. Would the social media, in addition to Medicaid, would it also be the ASO? Or no? I mean, we have been including them in some of our communication strategy around this benefit. So I don't know. I think we are right now just trying to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of communications. Okay. Thank you. So we're deleting number three as well. Number four. So is this feasible, Nancy? This would be a huge change to how we operate our Medicaid program. So right now, um, for most of our populations, where the federal poverty limit ends is where the subsidies for free or reduced premiums on the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange begin. So it's sort of a seamless transition of if you're ineligible for Medicaid, then you can get transitioned to the exchange and be eligible for a QHP um, or a different plan on that. So this would be um, taking from that population just generally, and it would be Besides being a huge system change, it would probably have a a very large fiscal impact. So it sounds like this is not a feasible recommendation. uh, Are you comfortable with deleting this? So we will delete. Number five. So this is already uh, a recommendation. We can uh, delete this one. And it it was a little bit more spelled out previously, so. Yes. I think we've discussed this as well. So while we did discuss community health workers, I, I don't know that we've specifically discussed like who would be responsible for expanding their training. Dr. Remy, you're admitted. As far as the wording of number six goes, prior to discussing who would be responsible for that, perhaps expand community health worker training and include dental health literacy in the curriculum. And then as a part two, As we have learned at West Virginia University, community health worker training, as an example, is within the dental hygiene curriculum, and that exists across the country. So as a part two to that stanza, I would say integrate community health worker training into dental workforce curriculum, something like that. Um, As far as who is responsible for that, um, the... There is like a certification training and accreditation group that oversees community health worker certification. So I think we would want to collaborate with them to, though they have those um, kind of tenants to the curriculum, to somehow encourage a dental health literacy aspect into to the curriculum, I think would be a good thing. And I don't, I think programs vary as to how much they do that. So um, some collaboration there, I think would be a good idea. So something like encourage the community health worker educators to implement or expand their training or courses to include dental health literacy yes. as part yes. as part of the curriculum. Yes. And then also integrate community health worker training into dental workforce curriculum. Yes. I'll say existing dental workforce curriculum. Right. I I just want to say as an aside, like I had assistants and staff members go through the ADA community dental health coordinator training, but they could not get the Maryland certification because that program is not, is not able, it's not certified in Maryland. So this is something that's just coming up now where the certification process is a whole thing of applying and of of getting a a certificate. So it's a very detailed thing that I think we want to be aware of and make sure dentistry has a part 
in the curriculum and on the other side, community health worker tenants and ideals are integrated into the curriculums of our dental assistants, our dental hygienists, as these skills are really critical in their ability to um, help people access care and deliver care. So does that um, does that look like what you wanted to say? I would take out the word courses because it is a training and it's like a certified training that has to have certain tenants to it. So I would take out the word courses. And I think it's okay. Any discussion about that? Okay, number seven. Have we discussed this before? I, I don't think we've discussed this specifically. The reason there's an asterisk here is because this falls under the general um, theme of increasing Medicaid reimbursement, which is like a, a common theme amongst a lot of the recommendations. Okay, so we can delete that one. Well, unless there's an interest in having it specifically for community health workers. Well, there is. So that's that's the, the point here is this one is specifically on community health workers as opposed to the more general theme of just expanding, Dr. increasing Ramey. rates or expanding reimbursement. Dr. Ramey. Um, not being reimbursed is a huge barrier to community health workers being able to be used more. So if there was some type of Medicaid coding to be able to pay for their services, it could be a game changer. Mm -hmm. More groups being able to hire them and in more people saying, hey, I could be a community health worker and actually make a living wage, right? As opposed to volunteering or putting that as another um, you know, task in, in my other job or as a volunteer service. So I think this is a critical thing to look at and look at models of where other states are doing this. So I think this is something that really needs explored because it's a game changer in how we would approach access by utilizing these very valuable healthcare professionals. Nancy? Yeah, I know we do. I believe we do have some services that are sort of bundled services that do include community health workers as a part of that service. Um, it's not really something we've explored as a part of our dental program. So that is something that we would need, need to take to the Department of Budget and Management to get approval for funding, um, as well as we would take need to have a lot of discussion internally about how it would be best to implement that type of initiative. So are you okay? You all okay with the wording as it is, or does it need to be um, further explained? Okay, number eight. Um, we have addressed this mm -hmm. with other subgroups, so I think we can delete that. I think the same is probably true for nine. Mm -hmm. Increase, yes. And I think we've discussed, discussed number 10 as well. Um, the only point on 10, I think, is teledentistry. I don't think it's been specifically mentioned anywhere else. It is, it wasn't, uh, Nancy. Yeah, we are currently working on exploring some of the teledentistry stuff. We're reimbursing for it now due to COVID-19. Um, but I, I think if some of you followed, I think it was Senate Bill 3 from, I don't know if it was 2020 or 2021, um, that required the Maryland Health Care Commission to do a big study on telehealth. Um, so we're working with them to try, and we'll grading the results on that report to see um, as well about telehealth recommendations, just overall as a whole. So that's something that it already exists that you're working on. Yes, okay. So we need to delete that one, please. Expand dental homes for adults. Dr. No, this if you delete teledentistry and, and do 
we not hear back about it? You know, could we encourage the health department to increase the fees? I mean, if we just delete it, it's out of the report. And I think it's important to include that we want to consider teledentistry is a viable option uh, and should be reimbursed. I don't recall anywhere else in this document so far where we've even mentioned tele, telehealth or teledentistry. So um, would it be more appropriate to put what is um, currently going on with the discussion of teledentistry in the background or to leave it as a recommendation? Nancy, I'll defer to you on that. I mean, I have language that we can we can share with you to be added to the report that exists. <laughs> if you want. Well, my, my point is, if it comes out as a recommendation, does that help in any way for the health department to move it along? Is it like a legislator would read this and say, oh, you know, this is important um, <laughs> to put a little bit more oomph into it. There's so much already going on in this space um, with the Maryland Healthcare Commission, um, and I and that's a legislative mandate. So there's definitely a report coming on this issue. Um, okay, then I'm I'm fine just including it somewhere in the report. All right, okay. so we'll delete this and we'll say Nancy will provide. Oops, Nancy will provide background on teledentistry and. MHCC study. And then we'll put that up at the top in the background section. Okay. Um, so expand dental home for adults. Uh, it, could someone from the group clarify this for us, please? Uh, Dr. Romain. No, and, and, and just before we, we, we move on, Help me to understand again where in our report it says increase Medicaid dental reimbursement rates because that's very important. Are you guys saying it's it's redundant? It's said in other places, or where is number eight in the report already? Um, that has been discussed with several subgroups, and it is also listed under our high impact recommendations. Okay, so it'll be like in the end in a bullet right, point under yes under high impact recommendations. That's all. I just wanted to. Okay. All right. Um, someone, where are we? So it was, it is still listed under the adult population recommendations, increased Medicaid reimbursement rates. Um, and significantly increasing reimbursement rates is still listed. I think this is up in the pediatric population. It's not necessarily a problem to keep listing it. Um, just because it's shown in one place. The, the reason it was then shown as a high impact recommendation is because multiple groups were making the same recommendation. So you could leave it here just to note that the subgroup was making that same recommendation that someone else made. It's up to you all. What's your decision? What's your pleasure to leave it or yes. to know that it has been recommended by several other subgroups? I would leave it just so that way maybe they're seeing it several times from each subgroup. So if every subgroup is saying it, I think maybe we just leave it there so that way it's it's the same theme is occurring. Okay, we'll leave it. Um, so number 11, is there someone from this subgroup that could give us a little more clarity on what this means to expand? Debbie, I'm happy to say, I think everything that we have discussed in the different um, groups so far, especially with regards to um, expanding provider network and participating providers is addressing this. Um, unless anybody else in my group disagrees or has anything else to add to that. So what is your recommendation? It's already, I believe it's already been covered in okay. other recommendations. 
Okay. Um, the only other thing that I would possibly think of is um, a, a program that's already existing to facilitate more safety net uh, clinics or safety net um, centers that are able to accommodate um, or care for particular populations, especially in the rural area, to increase the options. So do you have a wording for this? Um, possibly the um, implementation of the program, or I have to think it out. This is just coming back to me right now. Um, okay, while you're thinking, um, let's see what Charlie, would you have some, something? Yes, but, well, it, um, when I'm thinking of expansion of dental home, it, it, aren't we also talking about expanding the, the pool of dental providers? And I, I wanted, I kind of missed the boat earlier on incentives, if, if I could, for recruiting providers. Um, that it will be, we'll talk about that. That's number 12, incentive. Okay. Okay, then, then, I mean, I'm unclear on 11. Yeah. We also had creating provider incentives. No, number 11. Yeah, I'm just noting it was one of the things up previously on one. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You know, how are you going to expand the dental home for adults? One way of having it is having more providers available to see that pool of patients. You know, one way is educating the public, hey, you have a dental home available. And then part B is, hey, here's the provider that you can go see that's close by, um, convenient times, and et cetera, et cetera, that we've all been talking about. Well, Mary, have you had a chance to think about how... You would well, like I'm, I'm thinking about what Charlie, Dr. Doring saying, and I agree, but I'm also thinking about expanding the number of, again, safety net centers, particularly in rural parts of the state that would make it fairly, or at least a little bit uh, easier for adult population to access care. But then it, go, it goes to what Dr. Doring says, you have to have the providers to be able to put in the centers. So we talked about increasing provider participation. Is there something different you'd like to say here? No, I think um, no, I think that covers it. Good. Well, we'll just to clarify, earlier. we took out the language on increasing provider participation. And but because I thought you mean in this subgroup, not because it, we've talked about it before. Dr. Dorn. Well, I think we're specific since this is coming out of the Medicaid subgroup, we need to target Medicaid providers. And, and so I think, you know, maybe we were a little quick to eliminate number one item, because I do think that besides increasing fees, there's other ways of engaging providers um, and, and, that, and that might be certain tax incentives for providing care, certain kind of rewards or recognition, or maybe uh, a certificate to a free CE course. It's just kind of a pat on the back, you know, thank you for doing a great job. And that gets word of mouth to other providers and, and they may be encouraged to sign up without, you know, breaking the budget and increasing fees. I think there's other ways of incentiv incentivizing. Uh, may maybe a certain percentage of Medicaid fees collected aren't subject to state tax, for example. So can I suggest that we move to number 12? Because that is, um, that is the next recommendation. And so if we want to clarify what if you want to list examples of what those incentives could look like and um, who would be responsible for those, that would be helpful. 
Well, the number 12 list by geographic area, I certainly incentives for all, all practitioners to, to incentivize them to sign up and, and to re-enlist to be providers. And so we can, we can uh, accommodate that to include all providers and not yeah. be specific to geographic areas. And I think it would be the charge of the health department slash Medicaid slash uh, Maryland Healthy Smiles provider to come up with suggestions uh, besides fee increases for incentives for people to, uh, for providers to sign up under the program. So do you want to list the examples of... Um, um, sure, and this, these CE are just courses. recommendations that people have made to me. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this maybe a certificate of appreciation, um, some kind of small reward. Uh, a free CE course or tax incentives. Okay, I'm sorry. Can we can we take a, a step back? Sure. This, the, the, we're looking at 12, and that was um, made by this subgroup specifically to focus on um, providers in rural communities. Is there an interest in maintaining that distinction between um, certain incentives for providers to um, relocate to these underserved communities? and have different incentives for the general increase in the provider population? Or are we getting rid of the distinction with the rural communities and just saying a general increase in providers is necessary and so it doesn't matter where they go? Dr. Cohen. Dr. Cohen. Um, yeah, I think, you, I think for this provider incentives, you kind of, I think we should just, talk about it the same way that we did up above where it was some sort of um, funding for tuition reimbursement to move. You remember when we were talking in that incentive before with Dean Reynolds? So, I mean, the incentive, you know, to get people to geographically, these areas would be like through some sort of tuition, you know, um, scholarship or something like that that we had talked about before. So I think just, if we can use the same language that we used before, I believe it was, I think it was in the pediatric group. I think we could just duplicate that here, couldn't we? Well, and that's actually, I think number 13 was increase the number and type of student loan repayment programs. I think there was something about incentives to providers in that one too. I don't know if it was the loans, like low interest or zero interest loans or something we had recommended before. And we have both of these things earlier. It's just, do we just want to like copy the text from that and make it consistent? So this recommendation previously was expand the Maryland Dent Care Loan Assistance Repayment Program to include dental hygienists and increase the reimbursement rate. Yeah, it wasn't that one. It was under the pediatric because I remember that I... This, this is under the pediatric. And then there's the what we just discussed earlier in this meeting on the stakeholder work group to study and make recommendations relating well, to a grant or no interest what was number What was number one in the pediatric? The pediatric? Increase the Healthy Smiles provider network in areas that are in need. Offer dental students, dental dentists incentive to open offices in these areas. Is that what you're thinking about? Yep. So you're saying that we need to, um, is this for the incentive or is this about the student loan? Can we go this back is, to the This is for number this is for number 12 providing incentives for providers to I mean they're essentially saying the same thing. Can we go back to the um, where we were under Medicaid please?
So I think, Charlie, were you saying you'd like to include all providers with some type of incentive? Well, I'm fine uh, reiterating what the, the recommendations from the pediatric group here too, because that's gonna benefit all the Medicaid through student um, tuition waivers or whatever incentives. Um, so that's really gonna help in those geographic areas. And then maybe a separate line item for incentives for all areas. Is that what the group wants to um, keep the geographic area separate from all providers? So I, I think you can leave 12 as is, just the way it's written. Because they're just making, and we're just making the recommendation. I mean, I don't think, you know, you have to put what the incentive are and who provides. Um, I think you just keep 12 the way it is, and you probably keep 13 the way it is also, because they just, they just mimic what's been said before. And then we add a provide incentives to increase provider participation. Yes. As a separate recommendation. I would. And again, these are these are redundant recommendations. I guess the interest here is just in clarifying that the subgroups came up with these independently. And and then they the full task force supports that. Um, the discussion note here under 13 was just to clarify if it's increasing the number and type of student loan repayment programs, if that was also recommending to increase to extend that program to dental hygienists. That was something that was brought up previously. So is that a recommendation to extend because that would require legislation? To dental hygienist, is that a recommendation? There's probably shortages of hygienists and all dental auxiliaries in those area, remote areas as well. So do we want to um, include that in increasing the number and type of student loan repayment programs as an example? And I guess if not, what is what other type of loan repayment program is envisioned there, or should we be deleting the and type and just refer to increasing the amount of reimbursement under the existing program? But we've already stated that. that um, yeah, well, that, that would be another example of the same recommendation being made by two different subgroups. So, someone from the Medicaid subgroup, could you? Um, your thoughts on this? Dr. Woodward? Uh, so our, our discussion on this was yes, uh, to answer your question, Devaney, to include legislation for another type of loan reimbursement for a dental hygienist. Great, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we'll clarify that this recommendation is to extend that existing program to dental hygienists. Well, and, and I think it's important that we're increasing the number also. The number of programs or the number of recipients under the program? The number of recipients, right? Well, there's, you mean the... Number so I think it was I think it was increasing the number of recipients and also extending it to dental hygienists. Um, I don't. Where does it say um, to increase the number of recipients? I'm not. Well, I, I read it as when you're saying. Well, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for the Medicaid group. I mean, I the way I read it, I understood it was they were increasing the number of. Um. Mm -hmm number of uh, whatever, loan repayment, dental care, and also offering it to dental hygienists. 
but I'll let them clarify. So you want more than one loan repayment program. Is that what you're saying, Brooks? Or is it to include dental hygienist? The, use the current one, but to include dental hygienist, which, how, how would you like it phrased? Well, I, I would imagine if you had more loan repayment programs, you would have more participants to utilize them. They kind of go hand in hand. Uh, what we were thinking here was to, when we say increase the number and type, maybe number and type was hygienists uh, in, in one little catchphrase. Maybe not develop loan repayment programs outside of the Office of Oral Health by other entities. Although if the group thinks that's a viable recommendation, then sure. I don't know who would offer them. So would you, you would increase the type of student loan repayment programs to include dental hygienists? Correct. Okay. Can we um, have that please? I'm sorry, I guess I, I don't I don't follow. Is it a sep the, the idea is to include a separate loan repayment program for dental hygienists or just utilize the existing program that already has? Well, it would, be, it would be a separate program because it does not exist now. It would be under the loan assistant repayment program, but it would include dental hygienist. So it's using and the it, existing staff and the existing program structure. But yes. just allowing it to be for dental hygienists. So I think it, it would be just saying that you're expanding that existing program to include dental hygienists rather than creating a separate new program. Because that would have associated overhead that's presumably not necessary. Dr. Romain. So I would agree in writing it that way gives it the most punch and the most... Um, maybe likelihood that it might actually happen because the, the shell of it already exists. It would just be including hygienists, um, maybe expanding the number of LARPs or the amount, as we said, and putting hygienists on it. I, I think that's the easiest way to go about expressing um, something that we want that can be done. Do you want to clarify that this sh recommendation should include increasing funding to that program so that you're not taking repayment assistance away from dentists and giving it to dental hygienists, but that it's additive? I think that's a good idea. Again, I'll, I'll wordsmith that a little bit better so it's clear for the report, but I just wanna make sure I've got your ideas down. Okay, so um, I just want to um, remind the group it is now five minutes to six and we are not complete. We haven't completed this subgroup and we have one more to go. Is everyone willing to stay on the call? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. is that great? Thank you. All right, so let's move forward. Number 14. So this discussion note that this was previously in conflict, I believe we, deleted this from the pediatric subgroup. So it's now not in conflict. So it's just a question of expanding the number of EPSCT providers. Mary? Can we change the word expand to increase? Yep. Thank you. Number 15. Okay, no comments there. Number 16. Nancy has her hand up. So oh. for 16, 17, and 18, I'm gonna 
group them all together because they're kind of talking about the same topic. Um, so we have a lot of activities going on right now related to public health, our public health emergency and the preparing for the unwinding. Um, for people who really haven't been following um, during COVID-19, we haven't disenrolled anyone from the Medicaid program. Um, Cause this was, that was language included in the FFCRA, um, which is one of the emergency, uh, not emergency, but one of the laws passed during the beginning of, beginning of COVID. Um, so right now we have actually record enrollment of above 1.7 million. Um, but once the federal public health emergency ends, um, we have, we're going to be allowed to start disenrolling people again. So the things that we're working on, we're working with our managed care organizations um, to develop communications plan in order to be able to communicate with participants about the end of the public health emergency and what that means. Uh, so right now we're encouraging people to update their contact information so that we can reach them when the public health emergency ends. Um, we are exploring different ways of communicating with them through both paper, mail, and electronic means. Um, and additionally, and this is more on the federal level, um, for text messages, uh, there are specific rules about you have to agree and opt in to receive text messages. Um, so it, we're currently working on that on the federal level, working with some of our other state partners, navigating like how frequently and what types of text messages we can send given the consent that we've received from our Medicaid participants to be able to text them. So how would you like to consolidate those three? I think I would leave that back up, go send that back to the, the Medicaid subcommittee to see if they have any response to that. Yes, right. Um, I would I would suggest, and yes, you're, they are really all very related to the same sort of concept. And if these are things that Medicaid is already working on, then I would be all right with removing these as long as they're uh, a process that's already in place. Is everyone okay with that? Okay. All right, um, below this, we just had a couple of discussion notes. These weren't recommendations from the Medicaid group, but they were things that maybe someone had said orally in a meeting, and we just wanted to make sure that they were there in case um, anyone wanted to discuss them, whether or not there should be a specific study of Medicaid reimbursement rates and in relation to neighboring jurisdictions. Um, and then also there was, um, actually, I, I see Dr. Dorian has a stand up, and I think it was Dr. Dorian who raised um, questions about administrative issues relating to enrollment and renewal for providers. Dr. Doring. Thank you. Uh, this might be time to include in the survey ideas on um, provider incentives. As I mentioned before, you know, I can go through and relist them. I didn't see it added earlier on, so. No, I didn't add them. I thought we were leaving that open-ended for what, if we would like to add specifics, we can add that in. Well, I would say maybe we want to add on, under that second discussion, uh, recommend to conduct a study, and I guess that would be done by the Department of Health, on provider participation in Healthy Smiles, review of administrative issues relating to initial enrollment and renewal, and possible incentives to encourage participation. Did you want to list out specifics here? Um, the ones that have been mentioned to me are some kind of um, certificate of appreciation, uh, some type of reward, uh, continuing education or tax incentives. Nancy, you had a comment? Yes, related to the first point, um, we actually are working on a report right now um, about those reimbursement rates um, and rate increases and looking at neighboring states, um, as well as comparing the rates to uh, recent rate increases compared to what other programs are offering. So I, I think that's, that's something that is due to the legislature, I believe, on December 1st. So that's something that we have in progress.
So maybe delete this first one. Yes. And yes. then we then we we're left with MDH should conduct a study of provider participation, in healthy smiles, including a review of administrative issues relating to initial enrollment and renewal, and possible incentives to encourage participation, including certificates of appreciation, rewards, CE credits, or tax incentives. I'll spell out continuing education. I don't think we've said CE anywhere else. Great. Immigrants. Yes. So. <laughs> This is our last subgroup. Um, any Oops. comments of, uh, regarding the narrative? Dr. Corman had to leave the call, but he said he wanted comment on immigrants is that the MDHS website does have searchable database by language. Um, I don't know what MDHS is. Uh, healthy Smiles. Healthy Smiles. Alan, then, okay, thank you. Okay. When you apply or renew, you put in languages that you or your staff are versed in. Uh, so that's in the database. <clears throat> so the first recommendation. Any comment regarding that? That would be a, I mean, I don't, that would be a huge expense um, for the state. And I know that there are some states that are exploring, exploring opportunities in order to be able to implement programs like this. Um, but if there, it might, it would require a great increase in state state only funds and depending depending on how we implemented this type of thing, it would, we wouldn't be able to draw down a federal match. So we had a conversation with um, uh, California Medicaid where they've implemented covering um, all adults over the age of 50, regardless of their uh, immigration status. So that's just, um, that's where this recommendation came from. So we know it, it, would, it would, occur, would require a huge fiscal note, but I mean, I think in order to address the issue, that's, you know, it's something that needs to be looked at. Yeah, and we are implementing House Bill 1080 from the previous session, which is, um, will extend um, health insurance coverage, um, including dental coverage to uh, pregnant, pregnant women and pregnant people um, who are undocumented. Um, so we are making steps in that direction. Um, I think we're currently expecting that program to be able to go live um, July of next year. That's um, great, okay. So if we have uh, no other discussion, we can keep one. Uh, number two, has also been addressed. Um, I think that, I mean, we could delete it because it is one of our um, high impact recommendations. Your thoughts? I mean, I'll defer to you all. On the, on the one hand, you can leave it just to show that it's a, a recommendation that this subgroup came up with as well, or you can delete it if you think it's unnecessary to demonstrate that. What is the group feel? Does it need to be in every subgroup? Because it is listed as a high impact recommendation. So we'll leave it. Uh, number three. It's talking about uh, workforce shortage. Again. So this is actually somewhat redundant with two actually because it's talking right. about the quantity of providers. So I think we should delete this one. Would you like to delete two and save three since it says quality of service as well? Um, this is also specific to rural areas, but. Does I, would be more, I would be more in favor of deleting two and keeping three, but to give it the more emphasis of role. That's fine. 
number four. Are we okay with that? Okay, number five. We've talked about um, mobile clinics and um, I think they, we felt like there was a, a lack of discussion about teledentistry. So are we okay with keeping number five as it is? Okay, so I think that this is already number six. I'm sorry, we're moving to number six. I think that this is already a requirement. Is it not? Yes, it is. They identify it on their um, initial as well as their renewal applications. Yes, so that's something we can delete. And then this discussion note was another um, thing that was brought up at some point, but not specifically in the recommendations from this subgroup as to whether or not there should be some sort of incentive for providers who speak another language such as preference in getting loan repayment assistance or some other type of incentive. This is up for you all to discuss. You don't have to include this. We could just delete it as well. My preference would be to delete it. Number seven, any discussion of who would provide these translation services? So if there is, oh, Dr. Dorn. Yes, uh, it, it is um, in the Affordable Care Act that the provider must uh, provide translation services, even American Sign Language. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are services uh, via the internet that provide, I think one American Dental Association, the Maryland State Dental Association have one uh, provider uh, that does this, I think, in 53 languages plus American Sign Language. So um, that is available and, and uh, at a reasonable cost for members and non-members. So I think we can delete this one. Okay, number eight, I think... Um, these services are related to possibly community health workers and what they do. Is there any discussion about this? So this recommendation would be targeted towards the dental provider connecting patients and their families with community health workers to help access vital services such as childcare, transportation and legal services. Is that the idea here? Correct, yes. To have someone in the office that would be able to help them with accessing these other services. That makes sense. Dental practitioners should connect patients and their families with community health workers to help patients access other vital services such as child care, transportation, and legal services? Yes. Any discussion about that language? I'll just clarify, this is kind of open-ended. You're just asking practitioners to do this without any sort of specific well, guidance from any agency. It's actually to have a community health worker in their facility that can facilitate that those connections. So that there should be a community health worker in each dental office? Well, you know, or shared offices. Um, the point is that that service should be available. It could but be- But who is it who's making it available? That's the question. It could, it could be a dental assistant in the office. It could be a dental hygienist. It could be a front desk 
um, someone who sits at the front desk. The, I, the point we were making is that there should be this medical dental collaboration where, you know, these this population has uh, they have problems, con- you know, making the, those these connections to these services. So what can we have in place when they do come to the dentist that would help them access these types of services? So it could be community health workers or other staff. Yes. Um, but I guess my question is, is the onus here on the dental practitioners? It is on the, the, yes, where they come for their care, for their dental care. That's the point, yes. So, um, so yeah, dental practitioners not should, um, help make the connection for these patients and families to other vital services through either community health workers or other staff. Like that? I think that's clear enough. That's clear. Any comments about that? Number eight? So number nine. So again, our discussion note here is on who's got the onus on this. Is this training that happens through continuing education? Is this something that should be part of your initial training as a dentist or dental hygienist? I, I think this is a requirement for licensure, is it not? That's the point I was going to make. I'll yield to Dr. Verma, but it's a new requirement for dentists, dental hygienists, and radiation dental technologists to have this board certified course. Um, so I, I think it's... That is already in place and um, it is a requirement for them. So I think we can eliminate that. Great. Thank you. So I think number 10 speaks as really could be addressed in number eight when we talk about um, the navigators in office. So maybe we add um, in addition to legal services, say, and insurance coverage. Yes. Communities bring this language from down here. Yes. And that's a key component for the CDHCs is to navigate, help the patient navigate insurance world, the dental benefits. Okay, great. All right, so we've completed all of our subgroup recommendations. Now we'll take a look at our high impact recommendations. So what we did here is just outlined the recommendations that we saw as repeat recommendations um, amongst the subgroups. And then um, if anyone wants to raise something that might not have been a repeat recommendation, but is of particular importance to their subgroup. And so it seems like a high impact recommendation for that reason. That Dr. was sort of the idea of this discussion. I'm sorry, Dr. Ravane, did you have a comment about the previous section or this? So, no, I, I would like to, to discuss the, this part. Um, okay. So I, I would say through our, um, our deep dive into the report, I see where community health workers keep coming up again and again and again. So I really think they should be um, bullet pointed in the workforce, workforce shortages in rural areas group. Um, that would be what I'd say. Is that su- sufficient use of community health workers? Dr. Romain? 
Oh. I could say increased use of community health workers. I think you're muted. You were muted. Yeah, I would say increased use of community health workers. And, you know, we have the details in the part where we talk about having the um, dental kind of health literacy in the curriculum and all those kind of sub things. So I guess it's just a judgment of how bullety and short you want to be in these versus detailed. You know what I'm saying? Some of the details are in the other part of the report. Um, yeah, and just to clarify, I mean, these are bullets now. We'll write it out as a narrative, but we aren't looking to just rewrite earlier parts of the report. We're literally just gonna highlight these were recommendations that were made repeatedly. So it's kind of like a conclusion, right? Of these are the things that we heard repeatedly and you look back earlier in the report for more detail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe like- Okay, under Medicaid, we need to um, delete increase annual caps. Yep. Uh, I would under increase public education on oral health. Um, should we include provider and patient there? Because I'm not sure what public ed education means. I think public was really getting more at patients just because hopefully providers are pretty well educated on oral health, but um, there was discussion on medical providers as well. Well, and the, the di different aspects we talked about which providers need um, more education. Mm -hmm. um, so under transportation, is vouchers still, is that something um, that should be included? because of what that is that might have been okay let me look that was under the pediatric group i believe no vouchers was still there but it's for uninsured right uh, mary mute it Gosh, you would think after two years. Um, under workforce or Medicaid, we talked about increasing provider participation in Maryland Healthy Smiles, but it's it's really, and that was recommended several times. And even though it's implied, it's not it's not stated here. And I think I think that's definitely a high impact recommendation. And I think that's that goes beyond the rural areas. So maybe it's own larger bullet, increase provider participation. And Maryland Healthy Smiles. Thank you. Okay, uh, Nancy. Um, just to weigh in, that bullet point might also go well under, under Medicaid. Um, and I think oh, that, yeah, thank yeah. You. the other thing I wanted to raise um, was for the last bullet point, because um, we haven't talked about, we've talked about requiring dental screenings in public schools, but we've also talked about it as requiring it for public schools. Um, and that's not quite the same thing. And for this was actually for both um, child care and school. I'd like if the in could be changed to four, so required dental screenings for public schools and for child care. Mm. Yep. Is it child care or daycare? I think it's child care because they're not all child care is done in a daycare setting. Okay. Uh, Dr. Romain. Oh, I, I, I just wanted to say that in reading lots of reports, a lot of the readers are going to go to this page and that's what they're going to read. So I know we've lost some people, you know, who've kind of gone off the call, but I, I just want us to really make sure this part's really good because I think it's the meat and potatoes of what we've done in a one pager. And I just think it's really important. That's what I wanted to say. Dr. Dory. Uh, yes. I, um, on the, uh, school screenings, uh, I think we want to include 
preschool and daycare. I mean, the, the intent is too many kids are going to the operating room with nursing bottle decay and it's required in Head Start programs. So why can't we encourage this in, in all younger children? I mean, by the time they get into the first grade, it's too late. So what distinction would you, um, I think that would get into the specifics. I think those have to be discussed at a later point. Okay, that's fine. You know, those, okay, um, so for vouchers, should we put for uninsured because um, the, the transportation already exists for Medicaid? Um, And also for mobile providers, do we want to increase the number of mobile providers or do we need to put a mobile and portable? Well, we ended up with um, the board looking at the, the current landscape and then um, increasing education on the use of You're right. mobile yes. and portable dentistry. So mobile and portable provider education. Could that, we could say that. Because what, what is the intent when we say there are transportation barriers? So how are we gonna address it with this? So we wanna uh, educate those that are currently um, to increase these type of providers? Right. Okay. I mean, I think the goal of the education is to encourage more practitioners to utilize these types of services, offer them. So when you look at the list, do you feel like this encompasses everything that we've talked about in, in more detail in all of the subgroups? What's, okay, Dr. Green, what, what's missing? Um, I, it's, a, it's a matter of the stress, like, for example, vouchers for uninsured individuals. Maybe that was discussed a few times, but really, as we look forward to January, how many individuals are really going to be uninsured? Like, is that such a major point that it deserves to be in these high impact recommendations? That would be my thought on that particular line. That would be my, my question there. So, well, vouchers will not be needed for those in Medicaid. Is that is that correct? As I understand it, that that is correct. I would defer to Nancy on that. So, when we look at, I guess it, it is addressing one of the social determinants of health for the immigrant population. I mean, uh, well, do we have anywhere for them to be transported to? You know, mm -hmm. um, what's what is more important? Um, and and because that is one subgroup, it would have only been addressed in that subgroup. It could have been in, addressed in um, Medicaid or it could have been addressed in the adult population, but it was focused on the immigrant population. So. Um, I think that there needs to be some recommendation in these common ones that addresses because the, that population is expanding and we don't have anything to address that need. Okay. So if you all want to put something different, that I, I'm fine with that, but I guess um, your thoughts about that? So do you feel like this list encompasses something from each subgroup that is that really needs to be addressed? So let's just, can we just go through them for the pediatric group? Um, the one of the, the recommendation for required screenings. Um, 
for what's the next group? I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think that the workforce shortage and um, increasing reimbursement rates was possibly made by every single group. <laughs> so right. I think just those two actually ends up covering every group. Every group, yes. So do you feel like that these other bullet points are need to have this higher recognition? I will also unfortunately note that we've lost like a whole lot of members at this point. Um, yes, and it is almost 6.30. Right, I just mean that unfortunately we're not getting to hear from a lot of folks. Um, well, at the next meeting, we're going to um, vote. Yeah. We don't expect that that meeting will take as much time, but we do need to make a decision so that we can have the report out by the 6th and then have it sent to MDH for review. So if, if no one else has any um, comments about this list, uh, I, I'm gonna say we move, we move it forward. Okay. Mayor. And I'm not mute this time. The only thing I, I want to say is I, I want to go back to what Diane, Dr. Romain was saying about CHWs. Um, increased use of CHWs doesn't say anything to me um, in terms of what we're really after. We're, we're after, from the recommendations, we're after uh, basically uh, utilization, technical, and recognition. And, and in terms of reimbursement and, and also, so I, I just don't think the word increased use, that doesn't, that doesn't work with me in terms of what we really were trying to get at. Um, so what is your recommendation for the language? Utilization and recognition form, I, um, or even say, Yeah. Well, I don't think any of these, they don't go into detail. That is something that, um, you know, the report uh, discusses. These are just bullet points. Then why don't, why not just utilization of CHWs? Because you don't want to use increase. Dr. Romain, do you, are you comfortable with increased? Um, I do think they need to be increased, but they are already recognized. Okay. So yeah, the recognition is there, but increased utilization, I think, is good. So you'd suggest taking out and recognition? Right. So increase, and you don't need the D, increase utilization of CHWs. I mean, our, our only other detail was that they be reimbursed, but I don't know if we want to go to that level of detail here. Right? Well, then that would be the detail that would, when uh, we're would ask about it, that would be under expand reimbursable procedures. Would it not? Yeah. We could say reimbursable procedures and services. Yeah. Great. Thank you for your patience. Sorry. Don't apologize. You're not on mute. I know. <laughs> Okay, this is the list. We're gonna move it forward. Okay, um, and then otherwise we've got the appendices. Does anyone left have any comments on the appendices at all? <laughs> Does anyone <laughs> want to be taken off the list? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we've just for everyone's benefit, we've got the list of the membership, Oops. Um, an overview of all of our meetings. Then we have um, a copy of that work plan that was discussed back in October 2021, if anyone can remember that far back. Um, then D we, is um, going to be a copy of the enacting bill that created the task force and E will be the draft legislation that Tyler and I are putting together. 
that will only cover any recommendations that actually require legislative action in order to implement, which a lot of these don't. So just to clarify, that's not going to cover every single recommendation, only the things that actually need legislative changes. So for example, dental hygienists in the LARC program. Um, then um, F is the PDF that I circulated on with the dental rate increases that are, were effective July 1st. And then we was stuck in um, a place for MDH to have a response letter um, that might come out if they don't choose to have one, but we put it in there. Great. So, so, so um, the, everything that we've discussed, we will get back by October the 6th. Is that correct? Yeah. And is, is Nancy still on here? Yes. Um, so Nancy, I know you've said that you were going to get me some language. I, I hate to do this, but is there any way you could get us that tomorrow? Um, cause we have a kind of a tight turnaround to get this for October 6th. I will and do my best. Thank you. Cause we've got Tyler and I have to make these updates from today. Then we've got to get it reviewed. And we have, um, Madeline, I think is also still on our support staff person. Who's going to have to, um, proof it and format it and just make sure that we've done everything like stylistically appropriately. Um, so we've got a few people that this has to go through. Then um, for our next steps, we're on October 6th, sending this final draft to um, all of the task force to review. We're also sending it to the um, executive director and the director of OPA over at DLS and to MDH for their um, review at the, the higher levels as well. So we're doing this all sort of concurrently. Um, the idea being there shouldn't be any other major changes after today because everyone has discussed everything that they wanted included in here. Um, and then we'll see everyone on October 20th at 5 p.m. to just vote on the recommendations in the report. And in the meantime, Tyler and I will be drafting that bill, which we'll also be inserting. All right. Any questions? Thank you all so much for hanging in there. It's late. It's all after 630, but good work. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. All righty. Okay.